The Short Mayo Composite was a unique aircraft built by Short Brothers in the late 1930s. In fact, it consisted of two separate aircraft, the Mercury and the Maya, taking off together and then parting ways. This remarkable story started in 1932 with Major Robert Mayo as technical general manager for Imperial Airways. The whole experiment was an attempt to solve the problem of building a passenger aircraft capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean without discarding cargo space for extra fuel. Short Brothers had already built and successfully sold the Empire class of flying boats, which were used to carry mail to the farthest reaches of the British Empire. Overland routes to Australia and South Africa were frequent, but one insurmountable challenge still existed, the Atlantic crossing. Certainly, the ocean had been crossed many times before, but only by small aircraft with no commercial application. Shorts wanted to fly the route, not for fame, but for commercial reasons. It was determined that much fuel was expended during takeoff, since flying boats took a particularly long time to become airborne. The solution was obvious. Attach a seaplane to a mothership and conserve fuel for the long trip across the ocean. With this, the Mayo composite was born. The lower half of the duo, Maya, was a heavily modified Empire flying boat. Its wings were enlarged and engines moved to accommodate its mounted passenger. And for the upper half, named Mercury, a long-range four-engine float plane was constructed. With a crew of two, it could carry a thousand pounds or about half a ton of mail. With all eight engines working together, the pair easily lifted off and soared upwards. The two aircraft were connected with specially made struts. At a set altitude, these would be detached and Mercury would continue on its journey while Maya returned to base. Here, test pilots John Lancaster Parker and Harold Piper say a few words following a successful flight. Well, damn it, I have never shaken you by yeah. the hand before, but there you are. Excuse my glass. Fine. And um, I don't know what your impressions were when we left, uh, but I found the weather was much better than I expected it to be. And everything was going right, so I very quickly asked you your opinion. And you seemed quite content with anything I wanted to do. So, I uh, pulled the plug and you disappeared. The Mayo's first transatlantic flight took place on February 6, 1938. The journey from the west coast of Ireland to Montreal, Canada, took 20 hours and 21 minutes to complete, with an average ground speed of 137 miles per hour. the Atlantic now conquered, it was decided to make an attempt for the world distance record, from Dundee, Scotland to Cape Town, South Africa, in a single flight. Publicly, Imperial Airways claimed not to be interested in breaking records, but the starting location was moved from Southampton to Dundee. This extra distance would give Mercury the range needed to beat the standing record held by Russia of 6,300 miles. Sadly, mechanical problems with the fuel pump forced the aircraft down near Alexander Bay, less than 400 miles short of its target. When not in use as part of the Mayo, Maya operated independently between Southampton and Foynes on the west coast of Ireland. Among its more distinguished passengers were Eamon de Valera, Prime Minister of Ireland, and Sir John Salmond, former Marshal of the Royal Air Force. The lifespan of this one and only prototype was short. Further advancements of the Empire flying boat and the sudden outbreak of World War II rendered the Mayo obsolete. After some four years of service with Imperial Airways, Maya was destroyed in a German bombing raid on Poole Harbour in early 1941, while Mercury was pressed into service with the RAF. And yet... By pioneering commercial aviation across the world's second largest ocean, this strange-looking contraption could be seen as the early forerunner to the jumbo jets that now so frequently cross between Europe and the Americas. The Royal Air Force's Sunderland was Britain's iconic flying boat of the Second World War. The type was built by Short Brothers, and it went on to serve for many years, and indeed in many places, well after World War II. 
Sometimes called the flying porcupine because it bristled with defensive firepower, it is perhaps best known for its role in protecting Allied convoys during the critical Battle of the Atlantic. In this theater, the Sunderland flew alongside American-built PBY Catalinas and scoured the North Atlantic Ocean for German U-boats, which at one stage had almost succeeded in choking the flow of vital material to war-torn Britain. Ever-increasing amount of airmail. The Sunderland military flying boat was ordered by the British government at about the same time as the Empire boats, but as the RAF's peacetime needs were less pressing than the airmail service, Sunderlands came into service later. Although the two types shared the same basic design, there were still some major differences. The Sunderland's nose was longer, which was necessary to accommodate the forward gun turret, and other alterations were made for the rear defensive position below the rudder. Provision was also made for waste guns, although latter models had a power turret above the middle of the fuselage. It's a small wonder that the Sunderland would earn the respect of Luftwaffe pilots, who dubbed it the Porcupine. Clearly, Short Brothers had produced a true man of war, and as such, where it might operate would be less than predictable, so a deeper hull was provided to cope with harsher conditions. The Sunderland's interior would offer none of the luxury of the Empire boats, although there were many facilities that few other military aircraft of the time could provide. Sunderland, of course, was a gentleman's aircraft. I mean, it had upstairs, downstairs, galley, wardroom, flushing loo. So the impressive thing about it is it um, carries all mod cons aboard. You have your own kitchen and everything else there, and bunks and what have you. The, the, the flying porcupine, it was actually because of the armour we had. We, you see, we had a, a mid-upper turret and we had a front turret which had uh, four Browning 303s. Then they altered that because after a while the subs started fighting back from the surface. They put fixed gun positions in and we had 4.5 uh, cannons in the front. The idea being that um, you know you could hit the subs as you were coming in to take them and uh, that would knock them out or knock their gunners out. And we also had two waste positions where we we had um, point fives on, on swivels so they used to come out of the side. Yes we was, we were, they did call us the flying porcupines. JQ 88s were the main uh, people we worried about because they uh, used to have a good range and they could come out, you know, as far as we were. Meanwhile, the United States and Russia had both contemplated long distances and heavy loads and were already building to suit. Aircraft like the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress were starting to demonstrate their worth as effective strategic weapons that might hold the balance of power if another major conflict was to erupt. By 1936, British war planners were looking for an answer from its aircraft industry under Ministry Specification B-1236. The most promising concept came from Supermarine Aircraft, with its Model 317, which was quickly commissioned. However, as a backup, Short Brothers offered its Model S-29, which was most fortunate as later the Supermarine Bomber Project was completely destroyed in a German bombing raid. Thankfully, the Short Brothers offering had been developed in very quick order due to the fact that it used many of the Sunderland's parts. In fact, Model S-29, now named the Sterling, was in many ways a Sunderland with the hull and lower deck removed. Of course, there was much reworking to make the change effective, but the lineage was clearly there to be seen. The Sunderland's wings were especially quick to be adapted from the flying boat, although here Ministry intervention was to provide yet another interesting tale. Originally, the Sterling would have had almost the exact same wings as the Sunderland, with a span of 112 feet. However, the Ministry insisted that the wingspan be reduced to less than 100 feet to fit into certain early RAF hangars. The shorter wings severely reduced the Sterling's high altitude performance, and also required a longer distance for the aircraft to become airborne. To get Sterlings in the air quicker, Longer landing wheel legs were developed to increase the wing angle as the bomber was taking off. However, Short Brothers' first attempt at a retractable undercarriage would also be problematic. Curiously, the shortened wing actually had its advantages. 
mainly because it allowed the aircraft a high rate of roll, which made it very agile and more able to avoid attacking fighters. Born out of a famous flying boat, the Sterling was generally very well liked by its crews, perhaps in some small part because it actually provided one crew bunk, another link to its Sunderland ancestry. By 1946, Sterlings were out of service with the RAF, with over 2,400 being built in five years, many of them by the Austin Car Company in Birmingham. This output was actually three times greater than that of the Sunderland flying boat that had spawned the bomber's creation. Sunderland flying boats flew on till the 1960s. When the last active example, one of the 777 built, was finally retired from the Royal New Zealand Air Force in 1967. The JRM-1 Martin Mars was the largest flying boat ever to enter production. Initially intended as a long-range bomber and ocean patroller, the Martin Mars was redesigned as a long-range general transport. Martin developed the Mars at his factory in Middle River, Maryland, and the original prototype, known as Old Lady, was launched in 1941. Although the Navy ordered a total of 20 Mars flying boats, by the time the prototype was fully tested, the end of World War II had lessened the Navy's need for the massive aircraft and they decreased their order to six and had her redesigned as a transport. The redesign involved the removal of gun turrets, bomb bay doors and armor plating, the addition of cargo handling equipment, cargo hatches and the decking was reinforced. The first Mars was named the Hawaii and was delivered to the Navy in June of 1945. She was followed by the Marianas, Philippine, Marshall Caroline and a second Hawaii to replace the original which was destroyed in an accident. The Mars served the US Navy until 1956 predominantly on the Pacific flights between California and Hawaii and established airlift and endurance records many of which they still hold today. In 1959 the four remaining flying boats were sold to a Canadian company to serve as firefighting tankers and today two still serve in this role. In the lonely skies over Reykjavik in distant Iceland, Norway's exiled Air Force rises to meet the Nazi threat. It is March of 1940, and the early battles of World War II are raging. The Royal Norwegian Naval Air Service orders 24 Northrop N3PB patrol bombers to replace their aging MF-11 biplanes. This is the first aircraft designed by the newly formed Northrop Aircraft Incorporated. But before they can be delivered from the United States, disaster strikes. Norway is invaded by Nazi Germany, and in the face of overwhelming superiority, capitulation is quick. Pilots scramble frantically to evacuate what remains of Norway's aircraft to Sweden, Finland, and most of all, Great Britain. Those who manage to escape the occupation flee to England, where they nurse their anger and plot revenge. These Norwegian exiles form number 330 squadron in Reykjavik, now trusted with the same Northrop aircraft that were destined for the Navy Air Service. Though nominally under RAF command, the squadron is staffed exclusively by Norwegians. Their primary duty is to escort the Canadian and American convoys, which cross the vast reaches of the North Atlantic. At this point, the U-boat threat is at its greatest, and Nazi wolf packs prowl the ocean, preying on unguarded supply ships destined for Britain and the USSR. And for this, the N3PB is well suited. A single Wright Cyclone 1200 horsepower engine gives it a range of 1400 miles, enough to patrol the shipping routes of the icy Atlantic. 30 and 50 caliber machine guns help keep it safe from the Luftwaffe fighters, and 2,000 pounds of bombs stand ready to sink attacking ships of the Krags Marine. The crew consists of a pilot, navigator, and radio operator. Three flights are established in Reykjavik, Akureyri, and Budareyri, each flying four planes. The Norwegian government in exile pays for the upkeep and maintenance costs, and their squadrons are soon re-equipped with short Sunderlands and de Havilland Mosquitoes. 
By the time all is said and done, Norwegian squadrons number 330 and 333 have made a valiant contribution to winning the war and liberating their homeland. The Saunders Row Princess was the last of the giant flying boats. With the exception of Howard Hughes' Spruce Goose, the Princess was the largest flying boat ever built and in May of 1946 work began on three prototypes of this gentle giant. The Princess was nicknamed the Double Bubble and designated the SR-45. She was intended to fly the non-stop transatlantic route from Southampton to New York, carrying 105 lucky travellers on her luxury outfitted twin deck. The Princess was powered by 10 Bristol Proteus 600 turboprop engines that were housed in six engine nacelles mounted in the wings. The two outboard engines powered single propellers, while the four inboard engines were the Bristol coupled Proteus. With a wingspan of 220 feet, nearly 150 feet from nose to tail, and a height of more than 55 feet, the complete Princess weighed in at a massive 190,000 pounds. In August of 1952, the first of the three prototypes, G-A-L-U-N, was taken out for taxiing trials. However, after only a short taxi at speed, the graceful behemoth took to the air. Upon return, her pilot, Geoffrey Tyson, simply stated, she wanted to fly, so I let her. This prototype princess was the only one of the three that would ever fly, although she made 46 test flights overall and made a memorable appearance at Farnborough Air Show in 1952. But the era of the graceful flying boat was drawing to an end. Since the end of World War II, conventional aircraft no longer lacked the long runways they required and they could operate the same routes, in many cases faster and more cost-effectively, than flying boats. But it was not to be. And in 1967, all three prototypes of the elegant Saunders Row Princess were dismantled, and the era of the flying boat came to a close. Meanwhile, other Convair designers were at work on a different project, a new type of seaplane fighter. And then because of the success of the XF-92A, the Delta Wing was applied to a seaplane. The world's first jet seaplane, the Sea Dart. Slow motion, the art of her design shows clearly. Spray is thrown to the sides, away from the air ducts that feed the engines. Water skis quickly lift the hull off the water for easier takeoff. Behind, a cloud of steam from the jet blast of her tailpipes. Once in the air, the Sea Dart skis are tucked up into her hull. 
and her kinship with the XF-92A is obvious. This Delta wing was the flying wedge that split the sound barrier and gave to the Sea Dart the title, World's First Supersonic Seaplane. With her Delta wing, landings are made at relatively low speed and as gracefully as a water bird. And her speed is matched by utility. For her, every sizable strip of water is a ready-made landing field. Bays, lakes, rivers, the sea dart can land on them all. In the early days of flight, most planes were flying boats. Lakes, rivers, bays and oceans provided ready-made runways. But by the time World War II started, these runways were not always located where runways were needed. So a shift to make runways and planes with landing gear became the usual configuration for aircraft. However, there was one seaplane that continued throughout the war and excelled in areas that other aircraft simply couldn't operate. Even though the plane was dated before the war started, it overcame its age to go on to be one of the most famous World War II planes in history, Consolidated Aircraft Company's PBY Catalina. Like most illustrious planes of the bygone eras of the Great Wars, the Catalina's creation can be found in the aspirations of one of aviation's great pioneers. This is 1918 in the United States, and it's the day the airmail service begins. But such was the importance of the event that President Wilson attended to witness the posting of the first letter. The pilot of the aircraft was Major Reuben Fleet. Fleet went on to form the company that produced the Catalina and many other outstanding aircraft. The corporation was Consolidated Aircraft Company, which was based in Buffalo. But by 1936, he'd moved the company to this site in San Diego, California, to build the Navy's new flying boat. During the Depression, contracts were scarce and competition was tough, and this move was a huge risk for the fledgling company. But like many of his contemporaries of aviation development, Fleet took to the challenge. His chief designer, Isaac M. Latin, was convinced that Consolidated could build a superior flying boat than what was already in service. His focus was on the airframe and improved engine technology. It's interesting to note that at this point all other seaplanes were biplanes. The Catalina was the first monowing to take to the water and the air. The original model was flown in 1933. Although there was a number of versions produced, it's the Model 5 that's most recognized as it was produced in larger numbers and was the most used during the Second World War. 
Boeing, Vickers and the Naval Air Factory also build them under license. The United States Navy employed over 3,000 of the Catalina. Other Commonwealth nations, including Britain and the Dutch, also utilized the outstanding services that the Catalina would provide. The distinguishing feature of the Model 5 and its predecessors is the bubble-type blister on the fuselage. This was used as a gun turret and offered superb visibility to spotting and tracking the enemy. The blister was also very useful in another role, that of sea rescues. The visibility from the blister was greatly appreciated by Catalina crews that were engaged in rescuing downed pilots and shipwreck victims during the war. One of the early examples of seaplanes being used as mercy craft or rescue planes is probably found in the Coast Guard's history. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, the Coast Guard regularly used the flying boat to assist in marine rescues and evacuations, as well as for weather observation. It was a natural transition for the Catalina's wartime duties. Seaplanes excelled in numerous roles during the war years, but one of their most outstanding successes was that of submarine spotting and bombing. In the early years of the war, the highly efficient U-boat captains dispatched a considerable amount of Allied shipping to the sea floor. At the time, there was little the Allies could do. However, it was realized that if the flying boats could be given a suitable range, they would be the perfect spotting platforms. The Germans had gained control over the crucial shipping lanes across the Atlantic in a bid to strangle Britain of the desperately needed wartime supplies. The PBY Catalina took over from the earlier bi-winged flying boats and two models were formed a true seaplane and an amphibious craft that had retractable undercarriage which allowed it to land on both the sea and terra firma. It was designated as the 5A model. There were obvious advantages with the 5A model, however they were slower, heavier and subsequently had a reduced range. As soon as Britain received the Catalina, they were immediately pressed into service as submarine hunters. The Catalina had a range that exceeded 4,000 miles, and this permitted it to escort convoys much further than was previously possible. The Catalina was the first real weapon that assisted in keeping the sea lanes open. The effectiveness of the Catalina was vastly improved when the first British radar system was installed in the North Atlantic squadrons. Once detected, the Catalinas would assault the submarines with bombs or depth charges. Consolidated's Californian factory continued to build the PBY-5 nearly right throughout the war. The PBY-5 was so successful that even as later models became available, the 5 and 5A model still maintained healthy orders. The PBY's construction was a mixture of boat building and aircraft manufacture. The wing, which was perhaps the most important part regarding the PBY success, was built from steel and hand-stitched canvas. The wing was made of steel and a skin constructed from a special unbleached cotton cloth that was hand-stitched to the steel framework. Combination of cloth and metal gave the wing strength and the linen contributed to the lightness of the construction. The wing was then coated with a special aviation dope that stretched the cotton tight and bonded the two materials together. 
The assembly of this consumed hundreds of hours of demanding craftsmanship. Another feature of the PBY's wing was its retractable wingtip floats that could be raised during flight to reduce drag and improve the aircraft's handling characteristics. The large wing of the PBY was the secret to the plane's success. It provided great lift and held the plane's entire fuel load that would give the PBY its legendary long-range capability. Another interesting fact is that the dry climate of California permitted the construction of some aspects of the PBY, such as the fitting of the wings, to be completed outdoors. This saved the company from having to build thousands of square feet of roofed factory space. Tens of thousands of rivets were required, and Consolidated's rivet machine produced about a million rivets a week. Due to the stress of landing on water, the hull needed more attention to detail than other planes of this vintage, and the plating had to be watertight. The rivets needed special attention to ensure the tightest fit. They were frozen until required. When pressed in cold, they would warm and expand, and that ensured a tighter than standard fit. The craftsmen at the Consolidated Manufacturing Facility were as much boat builders as they were aircraft builders. The fuselage had to pass a watertight test. Since it wasn't feasible to build a water tank for testing the integrity of the fuselage, rather the fuselage was filled with water and checked by inspecting the outside surface instead. The center spa was a unique design for its time as it housed the flight engineer. Normally, he would sit behind the pilot, but in this plane, he sat above the pilot and was indeed very close to the engines he monitored. The PDY-5 was ordered in December 1939 and had an improved power plant of two Pratt & Whitney double WASP engines rated at 1200 horsepower, compared to the PBY-4's 1050 horsepower. Just four bolts held the engines to the wings. Nearing the final stage of construction, the aircraft was painted. Aircraft designations such as BL, which stands for Light Bomber, reflected the aircraft's use. In the case of the Catalina, its letter designation does not reflect that the craft is a plane. The letters PB stood for patrol boat and the Y was the consolidated description. The PBY's greatest asset was its range and the ability to fly comfortably on just one engine, which further decreased its fuel consumption. In addition to this, it was rugged and had a great ability to survive hard water landings, which was greatly appreciated by the crews that flew her and the downed pilots that were saved by this aircraft. The PBY was in essence an early 1930s design, and although it was used in many theatres of the war, it was showing its age when it was compared to newly designed aircraft. However, it was so good at the roles it was given that even its outdated performance still couldn't hold back the Catalina from going on to become a legend. The Catalina fell short in many areas, for example its top speed was less than many of the cars of that day, and as a bomber, the wing design couldn't even cope with half the pressures of a newer dive bomber. Interestingly, the legend of the PBY Catalina can be found in another great aircraft. The B-24 Liberator sits in the shadow of the most famous bomber, the B-17 Flying Fortress. However, in the beginning of the war, it was the most influential bomber and was manufactured in great numbers.
A total of 19,256 planes in several versions were produced by Consolidated Lulti, Ford Motor Company, Douglas Aircraft and North American Aircraft between the years of 1939 and 1945. The success and strength of the B-24 Liberator is due to a wing design sold to Consolidated in 1937 by David R. Davis, who was a near-destitute inventor. Reuben H. Fleet, the president of Consolidated, was convinced through wind tunnel tests that this slender wing with sharp camber would provide greater lift. Not only was the B-24 Liberator produced in greater quantities than any other American bomber, it also flew in more theaters of war by the air forces of more countries than any other four-engine bomber. A fully armed and combat-ready B-24 carried a crew of 10 men. Its gross weight when loaded was greater than 60,000 pounds. In its most common form, it had four movable turrets, each with two 50 caliber machine guns and two individual 50s in the waist, making a total of 10. It was powered by four 1200 horsepower engines and carried 2750 gallons of fuel. Many B-24 missions were round trips of 1500 miles and some extended ranges were closer to 2000 miles. The planes were not pressurized or heated. Crewmen wore oxygen masks on high altitude missions and were exposed to temperatures that reached minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit and below. A PBY-5 Catalina was not Consolidated's only seaplane in production during the war. In 1936, the company started production on the much heavier patrol bomber, the PB-2Y. This was a larger plane with four engines and a double-decker fuselage. Unlike the Catalina, this plane was only produced as a flying boat. No amphibious version was available. The PB-2Y never achieved the fame of the Catalina. Only small numbers of the PB-2Y were built. It was Consolidated's model number 29 and production ceased in 1941. This plane never reached the acclaim of the Catalina. Perhaps the Catalina was just the right plane for the right job, even though in most aspects the plane was outdated. This is evident in the laborious task of preparing the Catalina for a mission. More modern craft had better and quicker methods of flight preparation. The Catalina was a hands-on job. Sub-Catalinas operated in many secret operations throughout the war. They flew night missions and were painted black. They became known as Black Cats. Their roles included mine laying, bombing enemy shipping and sea rescues. They most often worked alone, and the only cover they had was the black paint that helped camouflage them in the night sky. The Black Cat crews left at dusk and their flights extended well into the night. At that time, there wasn't any such thing as global positioning and night flying gave them little opportunity to navigate by visual means. Their main means of navigation was the stars. The crews mostly flew blind. A crew may be grateful for a moonless night for safety reasons, yet the same night resulted in a much reduced chance to find and destroy an enemy. Although nearly invisible to the eye, the engine noise often alerted the enemy to the presence of the black cats. If they were lucky, the cats would be able to strike first and withdraw in success before the enemy could get into full swing. The Japanese became aware of the black cats tactics and put together the Japanese night fighters to counterattack. The old Catalina was very susceptible as its age was a very real barrier to any performance flight. However, with black paint, 
and the ability to land on water, the cats often dived and skinned the ocean in a cat and mouse game of detection. The antiques of the black cats has only recently come to light as the veil of secrecy is lifting. They stealthily hunted down freighters, submarines, tankers and even destroyers. They were named black cats, but in their black paint they could just as easily have been called panthers. The Catalina was a success in both battle actions and commercial applications. In fact, after the war, many went on to continue in service for many years. It was not in any way an outstanding performance craft, but it was outstanding in simplicity, ruggedness, reliability, ease of service and long range. ABY was just a perfect plane for the roles it was given. It seemed the plane was designed around these roles. However, the irony is the plane was designed well before its wartime missions were called for. Welcome to the Dronescapes Aviation Channel. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. 
Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.